I think my screws were loose. There we go. And nothing new. <laughs> At least I'm among great company, Dave. That's, yeah. Yeah, God's holiness reveals how screwed up we are. Absolutely. And uh, I was talking with somebody recently just how, just the movement of the North American church in light of some news things that we were watching. And, and what's missing among many believers, churchgoers, is God's holiness. We love to celebrate God's love, God's grace, God's mercy, the God's blessings. We have lost God's holiness. And so I hope just in singing that song and meditating on the words a little bit, and as we come to God's word, know who you are coming to. Know who and whose presence you are in. Know who wants to speak to you. Know whose kingdom has come and is at work in the world. And so let's remember that uh, we follow a holy God, and holiness is love and justice held perfectly in tension. God extending his love and his grace and his mercy, but also his wrath against sin, fully satisfied and justified in the person of Jesus. So in Jesus and in this whole movement that we're about, it's God's holiness and fulfillment and God's love and grace and mercy and fulfillment. And so we come as a people of grace, but we are called to become holy and be holy because our God is holy. So as we come to God's word, let's come with a little bit of fear and trembling and excitement that this God, who is perfect and holy, wants to speak to us. So let's pray. God, thank you for the privilege of being here this morning. Thank you for your goodness. Uh, God, I thank you that you are holy and that we are to fear you because that makes you one worthy of my life and more importantly, worthy of my praise. That you are a God that uh, makes sense and are justifiable in our world. God, you are someone who has justly invited us into your presence through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Uh, you rightly call us to be holy because you are holy. You call us rightly to love you and to love one another and love our world because you are love. All of these things are found in who you are. God, I pray that we as a people would not overlook your holiness. And if we're really honest with ourselves here this morning, I have been anything but holy. We are so in, in a process of being changed. And so as we come to a time together as a people, as we already have in worship, uh, the truth of worship, we come to worship your word and hear your voice. And I just pray that we would come rightly with some fear and trembling. We'd come expecting to hear the God of the universe that wants to speak to us and lead us forward. And God, we would, we would confess what is in in the way and, and uh, obscuring your voice and, and blinding our eyes. I pray that we would confess our sin to you and proclaim the sufficiency of Jesus to cover that and make us new and whole. God, we want to be your people. We want to be your temple in this world and for people to see you in us. And so as we come to your word, I pray that we be excited and expectant to hear your voice speak to us here this morning. Thank you for each one that is here and God, who they are and the journey that they're on, it is not by accident that they're here. And I just pray that you'd bless us with your word and your spirit. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, just uh, an aside, if you have a child that's uh, five and under, there is a nursery available. If you would like that, just go out the doors and hang a right. There's a little room over here where they're taking care of for the remainder part of the service, if that's something that you would like. Uh, so it's my first Sunday back from uh, holidays. Um, I don't know, I'm a little nostalgic. Uh, exactly 10 years ago, I came to Brightview. And so 10 years and 25 years, those are kind of milestones. You kind of sit back and reflect. And so it's been uh, really neat for me to reflect on where we've been uh, as a body and as a church and where I've come as a person. And for the last several years, we've been working towards uh, seeking God's direction, what's the next step for us as a church? And so we've been working for, or I've been working on something for years uh, called Momentum. And uh, we, we sought to include the church in this or bring this to our church for, for almost years, actually, and for various reasons it hasn't come together. 
Um, but we really do feel that now is the time. Uh, this fall is, is kind of leading us to take that next step towards, um, I think, what God wants to do here, cultivating a culture of just not believing in Jesus, but actually following him. Jesus doesn't call us to believe in him only. He calls us to follow him step by step every day. And uh, one thing I realized that over the years that we needed uh, something to lead people through um, that allows us to live a life that's directional, not just destinational, that we just do some program and go home, but that we actually get in a journey together as a people where we are walking step by step towards Christ. And we've been doing that for the last 10 years and beyond, but there hasn't been kind of a, a church-wide initiative that invites you, regardless of where you are in your journey, to take just one step towards Christ in following him. And so Momentum, we've talked about for a number of years, and we've been kind of highlighting this over the last several months, that we anticipate things starting up here in the fall. And so I just want to put out an invitation for you to consider what step would God want you to take towards following him today? and in this next year. And so um, that's where we're going to go, and more details of that will come out as we go. And it's just an invitation for you to be a part of that in cultivating a culture among us of following Christ. And so as a way of preparing us for that, I wanted to do just a short series where we talk about the questions that Jesus asks. I kind of came across this a couple years ago. Someone wrote a thesis on, on the questions that Jesus asked. Depends on how you count them, but he, count, he asked about 307 questions. In scripture. And of all the questions that were asked of him, a little bit of debate on this, but you know how many he answered? Seven, maybe four. There's a lot of debate on that. Jesus has questions because people know the answers to some of their own questions in their their head. It's not that we, we need more information, and Jesus knew that, otherwise he would have asked, answered those questions. But rather, he wants us to know how to apply what a lot of us already know when it regards to being a Christian or following Jesus. And so when Jesus was asked a question, he just flipped it right on its head and asked a question back and said, okay, you kind of know the answer to what you just asked. Do you know the implication? Do you know what it means to follow me and to walk with me? And so I thought as a way of preparing ourselves for the fall is just let's explore a couple of questions that Jesus asks And just walk away from our Sunday morning wrestling through those questions as if Jesus, and I think he is, is asking that question of me. And so we're not here to look for all the right answers, but we're to look to how to apply what we already know. There's some new things that we need to discover, but it's not just really what happens here in church. It's, It's what happens after we leave church. It's not about, you know, what we know and the theology that we can develop, but rather, how do I live? And so this morning, I wanted to look at the very first question that Jesus asks according to Scripture. And it's actually in Luke chapter 2. It's a part of the birth narrative. It's actually a part of the Christian or the Christmas narrative. And at the end of Luke's uh, birth narrative of, of just how Jesus came into the world and everybody came and something we celebrate every Christmas, at the end of that, he tacks on this little picture of when Jesus was a boy at uh, 12 years old. So it's a part of this birth narrative. And, and it's here that we find Jesus' very first question in Scripture to us. The year 12, at 12 years old, it was a kind of an important time in most cultures around the world, not so much in our culture, but in most cultures, because at the time of coming to age. And so Jesus in this setting kind of puts before everybody really who he is and what his life is to be about. And so today I want to talk about what are we to be about? Because this is what Jesus is about. What what is Jesus about and what is he pursuing and doing and living? Who is he to be? And it's a picture of who we are to be and how we are to live. So Luke chapter 2, verse 41 to 53 is this narrative of Jesus coming to Jerusalem when he was 12 years old. So let's read that together. Luke chapter 2, verse 41. It said, Every year his parents, that is Jesus, went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the feast, according to the custom. After the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But they were unaware of it. Thinking, they, or thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. 
Then they began looking for him among his relatives and his friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. So this birth narrative gives us a picture of kind of Jesus' coming of age. And in this key time of 12 years old, we're seeing what is uh, his priority in his life and really what our priority should be in life and the direction of our lives. Uh, becoming in, coming of age and, and coming into adulthood is a big thing in most cultures. Uh, when we lived overseas, this is something that I kind of got exposed to a little bit. And I remember having some conversation with the students that we were working with, um, just what that coming of age time was like. And in our particular tribe or area of the world, part of that coming of age was to be circumcised at 12. Unfortunately, there is still some female circumcision. That's a whole other category. But I was talking to these male students and how they would get dressed up in their more traditional garb and everybody would come out and in front of everybody, he would be circumcised. And I said, man, that must have been tough. He goes, that was very painful, he said, and very embarrassing. But it was so important to them that a a boy become a man. And then he went on to tell me what a man had to do in his his tribe. And there were some really, really difficult things. So this is very common to become, to go from from a man to, or from a boy to a man and and the customs of that. In Jesus' time, um, it was a little bit of a different custom but you can imagine that, you know, Joseph was, would take Jesus down to this annual festival of Passover. It was one of three festivals they had to adhere to every year. So they travel down Jerusalem and, and celebrate uh, the, the Exodus story of the Spirit of God passing over God's people while they're in Egypt and, and slaughtering the firstborn of all the Egyptians. And so they were remembering that the blood of the Lamb was underneath the blood of the Lamb that they found salvation. And so they were remembering that by going to Jerusalem and celebrating for a week, okay? And so you can imagine every year this is happening, and, but particularly this year, this father Joseph knew my son was going to become a man, and it was my job as his father uh, to, to teach him what a man was going to be. And so you can imagine they go to Jerusalem, and, and he's walking through the, the streets of Jerusalem, showing him different shops and showing him what business would look like. But then they would come to the temple and they say, Jesus, this is, this is where God dwells. That God loves us and he wants to be with us as a people. And, and you could probably hear all the, the lambs making noise and maybe some doves over here. And he's like, and, and these lambs are going to be taken into the temple and, and slaughtered and their blood is under which we find life and salvation. I, you know, just kind of showing him what life is about and, and what his role is going to be as a man and, and as a husband and, a, and maybe a leader. And you kind of wonder, as Jesus was going through the streets with Joseph, if at a much deeper level, much more significant level, the father, the real father, God the father, was showing him something else. Jesus, as you walk through these streets, these people are lost and you are going to be their savior. Jesus says, you walk through these streets, one day you'll be carrying a cross down them. Hey, Jesus, when you come to the temple, you see these lambs, you are going to be the lamb that is slain for them. And see the temple? My spirit, through the work that you are going to do, is going to make these people, by faith in you, the temple and God's presence in the world. Jesus, that's who you are going to be. And you kind of wonder, as Jesus hit this time of age, started to see more and more who he was, more importantly, as we'll see in a minute, his relationship with that father. And so it was a key time of coming to age. And so that's why Jesus stayed behind. It's kind of this pivotal time 
It's the kind of time for us as the readers to realize that of really who Jesus is. He's just not this, this interesting birth story and the miracles behind it, but this is the Son of God. He is the Lamb who has come to save us. But of course, people didn't understand that. Mary and Joseph didn't even understand that. We can read in verse 43 and down that they kind of, after this time, they just take off. Now, you might think that Joseph and, and Mary are, are really lousy parents. I mean, we all have stories of leaving our kids behind, right? And I'm sure our kids have stories of when their parents have left them behind. But it was very common at this time to travel in large caravans and, and family units. And so it wasn't uncommon to just think your brood is in the crew and you start heading back in a big caravan. Eventually, they realize that Jesus wasn't there, and they go back and search for him. Now, you can imagine what that's like. We've all lost our kids before, and we've run around searching for them. But they find him in the temple. That's the equivalent. I was trying to think of this this morning. That'd be the equivalent of losing our kid in Edmonton and finding them in the seminary library. That doesn't make sense. Why would you be here? And all the more, like, how could you betray me as a parent? And so there's this interesting dialogue that after Joseph and Mary find Jesus in the temple, there's this dialogue that happens that reveals to us who Jesus is, where he is to be found in life today, and what kind of life that we're to live, because that's what he is about. And I hope that you will be like verse 47, that if you get to hear Jesus speak through his spirit today, that your mind and your heart is open to be in his presence, you will be like those who were with him even that day who were amazed. That's what God wants to do. We come to church so often and we have such low expectations. The God of the universe, through his word and the presence of his spirits, wants to speak to you and for you to be amazed. And so that's what I hope will happen this morning. There's two things that I want to draw out that I think this passage confronts us as believers in Jesus and reveals that that is just not enough. That we're not called just to believe in Jesus and have a certain understanding of him, but to actually to follow him. As we kind of see that pop out a little bit in this passage. And so, let's move forward here. Oh, we'll look at how we so often fall into this, this pattern of just believing. Mary and Joseph believed how many of you at the age of 12 of your kids would forget your wife becoming pregnant through the presence of the Spirit? Or forget all the things that happened when the night that he was born, the, 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 the lowly people of the earth that came to worship him? Or years later, the Magi from a distant land would come and honor him? Or you take him into the temple and just how God would speak through the prophets within the temple? And you just think, what is this? Who is this boy of ours? Would you forget that? I don't think Mary and Joseph forgot that, but I don't think they still understood who this boy was, who their son was. They, they believed something about him. There was these incredible visions and visits of the angels, and, but they, they were misdirected in, in where life was taking them, where this boy would take them. And so we see that in these questions Jesus asks. Why are you searching for me? Why are you looking for me? Don't, don't you know where I am? Don't you know what I am about? Now think of your own journey. How many times in, in various parts of your life have you asked that question? Where are you? This isn't the life that I thought you were to give me. What's really happening is we're getting distracted, we're, we're busy, or if we're really honest, we're really self-absorbed. I thought this would be a life of blessing, a life of easiness. You, you know, your love, your grace, your mercy, your, all those things. What, why is this so difficult? Why are things going wrong? Why am I confused? Why am I so anxious? Why am I getting sick? God, where are you? Why are you treating me this way? Can you relate to, to Mary's questions there? I'm going in this direction. Why aren't you walking with me? We kind of have this thinking that God's lost somehow. Or, or that he forgot to follow through in the promises that he made me when I came to faith. Or at least what I thought the promises were. We think that God's distracted by everybody else in the world. Or bigger things. Or that he's just quite 
Frankly, he's not faithful. Why isn't he following me? Did you catch that? Why is God or Jesus or the presence of the Spirit following me? Why, like Mary and Joseph, we're, we're kind of going in the direction that makes sense. We're going home. Where's Jesus in this? Why isn't he following me? We get a little bit of misdirected because we don't understand who he is. We believe one concept of him, yet we haven't submitted ourselves to following him. So that's the first question. Jesus why are you searching for me? You should know what I'm about and where I'm going. Why are you going in that direction thinking I'm there? Why are you searching for me? The other thing that we fall into when we just believe in Jesus, we, we become completely misinformed about who he is. Not just what he's about and where he's going, but his very identity. And we see that in this next question. He asks, you know, didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? There's a key thing here to, ca- to catch. Notice what Mary said in verse 48. Why have you treated us like this? Your father and I. Did you catch that? Luke's putting that in, in a very, very particular reason. Your father and I. And how does Jesus respond? I'm in my father's house. This time of coming to age, Joseph is the father. He's the one who's supposed to transition this boy into manhood. I'm his father. He's taking that seriously. And Mary's kind of coming to his age. Your father and I have been looking for him. You're supposed to be following us. And Jesus says, whoa, wait a second. My father is this one. This is where he lives. This is where he dwells. This is his business. Joseph is in a patriarchal society. He's the father. He's the teacher. He's the most important person in the family from an earthly perspective. And now Jesus is taking us from this usual perspective and he's transitioning us into a different perspective. Now to us today, if you've kind of grown up in the church, you've read this Bible before, this idea of a heavenly father is not new. It's because we live in a Christian, post-Christian world. In Jesus' time, To call God Father is earth-shattering. The God of the universe is anything but a very close, personal, intimate relationship. He's some kind of distant person. In the Old Testament, the only time that God is referred to as Father is he's the father of the nations. He's kind of like birthing a family, as it were. He's, He's overseeing all of these people. But there's no way I could come to know him. And Jesus makes this incredibly intimate statement, I'm in my father's house. I'm with him. And what he's talking about here is not so much a location, I got to go to church, but he's talking about proximity. He's talking about intimacy. He's talking about just being in the presence of God. And so he's communicating to us that life is about being personally conscious of God's presence with us all the time. And we're to respond to that and and live on an expression of that through worship, learning, communion, service. That's so different than just believing in Jesus and going to church every week. That we're being called into a personal relationship with our Father. And at this key time of life, Jesus is showing that this relationship trumps everything else. And in our culture, it's very difficult to realize that Jesus would be supposed to be more important than my, my kids or my spouse or my loyalty to my parents or good quality friends, that Jesus trumps everything. Or God himself trumps everything. I think everybody's astonished at this. They, they, they had a hard time understanding this. I mean, in verse 50, we can see that they didn't understand when Jesus was saying, oh, this is just a totally new concept. Or we could be like Mary and Joseph when we first encountered this Jesus, that we're so anxious and so confused about who he is. This this journey is very confusing at times. God, where are you? I thought you were going to bless me, but instead you're confusing me and perplexing me. So how do we move on from here? Well, we see from believing where we want to go as a church is we want to move towards following. And so in just who Jesus is and his position here in the temple, we get a picture of what does it look like 
to follow him as, as believers, as, as, as Christians. And where we want to go as a church is to facilitate steps towards following this Jesus. And just in this picture, we get four different things. I'll, I'll go through quickly. The first thing is that we are to be a lover of the law. Jesus is sitting among leaders, the, the, the brightest minds okay, of, of the Jewish world. This is like going into the, the greatest university and sitting among the, the highest faculty and asking the deepest philosophical, theological, spiritual, personal questions. What is life about? Jesus puts himself in the center of discussion around God's law, God's presence, God's truth, God's holiness. He's asking questions. He's seeking understanding. Now, because he's the son of God, he's giving back answers to their questions and sharing his wisdom. He's sitting at the feet of teachers. I was listening to somebody talk this week about this passage and uh, a big name, someone I respect, and, and he made a very interesting comment, the one that I agreed with. And that he's a, he's a pastor as well as a, as a prof. And he said, in my many years of experience teaching, he said, most students who come in the classroom are not willing to learn more than they already know. And when I was in seminary, I saw the same thing. I saw the same thing in me, but I saw the same thing in my, in my peers. And there was just a really small group of us that we would come and we'd sit together and we'd debate together and pray together and challenge each other and, and wrestle through questions that we had. And then I started to think of that this week that most, I would say, Christians are like that. That we come to church, okay, I have a faith in Christ and, and all this kind of stuff, but am I really willing to be challenged and to sit at the feet of our teacher and to learn more than I already know? I'm not sure. Jesus, in, in, his, in his posture, comes. This is the Son of God, guys. He's coming into the, into the place of learning, and he sits at their feet. There's a new kingdom being revealed. And so, are, are, do we have a posture of learning? Are we willing to acknowledge how much we don't know? Are we willing to acknowledge how wretched I still am and the work that God has to do in my life? for me to be holy because he is holy. Jesus is a lover of the law. And so where we want to go starting this year is, is to equip one another to love this word and to read it and understand it for all it's worth. And that's not something you can only do by yourself somewhere for five minutes. It's something that we have to do together as a community, as one body. Uh, there's even a study out there. I was talking with a missionary that we support as a church uh, who's at our place and we were visiting and, and, he's, and there's lots of studies out there and just the, the, ch the life change that happens in a person is proportional, actually ex exponentially, exponentially different on how much you read God's word and meditate on it. If it's five minutes a day, 10 minutes a day, 15, 20 minutes a day, in their research, there was just minimal life change in terms of people's values and behaviors. You start to get up to 35, 45 minutes, and all of a sudden there's this spike of people who've been radically changed by God's word, and, and their lives are in different directions. And so we got to be a people who love God's law. God love, God's love character. God love Jesus because Jesus is God's fulfillment of the law. And so the momentum is, is a place where we come for teaching and for questions and for community. And I'll be pushing you towards one-on-one -on -one time with people that you respect to come in and to just be a people of God's word. And just a question to think about is, are you even holding it this morning? The privilege I have of going to other churches is, is just, you know, get exposed to different things that are happening. And I look around and how many people are actually reading God's word when there's someone teaching it? We're not a people of God's word. And so a challenge to all of us is, you know, do I love this love letter to us? Jesus was a lover of the law. I need to move on. We also see in, in following Jesus, there's, we are bearers of God's kingdom. Uh, there's, there's a hidden word in here that's a little confusing to some. Um, 
But in verse 48, he said, didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? The literal words there in Greek, uh, the word house isn't there. Uh, The only word that's there is things. Don't you know that I had to be about the things of my father? And there's lots of debate on what does that word mean? Because it's very, it's not very defined and it's plural. So I'm not so sure house is the right definition or the right translation because it's a plural world. Don't you know I'm to be of the things of my father? Be about the things of my father. And and Jesus reveals later on in his life what that is. And it's the kingdom that has come. He's not building houses. He's not building farms. He's not building financial portfolios. He's not building careers. He's not building children. That's all a part of it, though. The movement is about the poor, the hurting, the orphan, the widow. Jesus' ministry is about the willing who would say yes. Jesus' ministry was not about believers or even disciples to some degree. His ministry is about those who were willing to follow and obey, to surrender. Who is those who are willing to be healed and let go of the things that are weighing them down? The things of God is to bring the kingdom on earth. Following Jesus is also living in this great tension called the now and the not yet. Now, there's this kind of strange part of this chapter when Jesus says, hold on, don't you know I need to be in my father's house? And then verse 51, he kind of gets up and obeys them and follows them back. It it seems like he just contradicts himself here. And what we see in this person of Jesus and then the the whole concept of the incarnation is, is something that seems to be in tension. That Jesus is Mary and Joseph's son. And to be obedient to the law is to be obedient to your parents. Yet, he was the son of God and was to follow the will of the Father. And so in this picture, we see his earthly humanness play out in obedience to the law, as well as his movement of the Father and his obedience to him and his proximity to him. And and it it just is a picture of, of us today, that we're to be fully justified, fully sanctified, made perfect through Christ, yet I'm such a screw up. Every day, I just live under mercy and grace and forgiveness. But every day, the more I come to him with mer- under his mercy, grace, and forgiveness, I am slowly being changed and transformed. I'm going through this process of becoming who I already am in Christ. It's like I'm, I'm in the now, which means I'm messing up all the time. I'm getting hurt from other people. I'm hurting other people. Yet as I continue to fix my eyes on Christ and the kingdom that has come, I remember who I already am and the journey that I'm on to the not yet. That's just part of this life. We're a part of the already, the kingdom come, I am saved in Christ, but the not yet, that we're still living in this world. And so we just got to fix our eyes on him. And so this is where a lot of the questions come up of, you know, what's wrong with this world when things are supposed to be better? Well, it's just not yet but we keep going. And so that's what the community of the church is about, just walking together with grace and love for one another. Finally, the last thing I want to give us is urgent. So often the feedback we get as leaders or church get, you know, like you're going too fast or you're pushing too hard or it's uncomfortable. There's a word in here that does not come through in most of our translations but it's very clear in Greek. And then Jesus' second question, he says, didn't you know? And there's this little word, and this word means it is necessary. And it pops up in scripture quite often when Jesus is making a point or the writer's making a point. It's one tiny little word and it's making it so clear. This must happen. It is necessary. Jesus didn't say, you know, it's kind of a good idea or I'm just being obedient. I have to be here. And it's found in this word had, you know, did you know I had to be? He's really saying it is necessary for me to be here. Don't you know that? This is what it's about. And it's about now. And it's that sense of urgency that we as God's people and followers of Jesus must live with. Jesus didn't go to the playground. He didn't go to the local swimming hole or to a bakery or, you know, 
somewhere else that was kind of more appealing to a 12-year-old, he went to his father's house, the very presence of God, because it is necessary to be there. And so we, as a church, have to realize that where God is, is where his plan of salvation is being revealed. And where God is, is us as his people. We are now the temple of God, the presence of God through the Holy Spirit. It is necessary for our lives to be the place where the kingdom of God becomes realized. Every day, beyond this building. And so where we're going as a church is to cultivate both these things or all of these things in us. And so I just want to give you a little picture of, of momentum here at Brightview. There's two things. And this is found in our mission statement. And we take it very seriously. And we will do it urgently. And that is to invite everybody to be into an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Not believe him only, but for you to sense the presence of the Father in your life all the time, everywhere. Now, we're all on different parts of this journey. And it doesn't matter where you are in your understanding. It doesn't matter on what you think you know, don't know, whatever. In this place, you are welcome to come wherever you are. Come as you are. And let's just take a step. Would you be willing to take one step towards an intimate relationship, not believing in Jesus, but an intimate relationship with him? And would you submit yourself to other people around you and to your leadership to guide you in that? That's what momentum is meant to call, uh, invite you into, to, to see God's glory, to worship him, to learn, to grow, to serve, and to sacrifice. Finally, we want to equip you, and this is a hard part too, but we want to equip you to be disciple makers. We don't want to just become Christians, believers of Jesus. The command that Jesus gave us was to make disciples. That means you are reproducing yourself, multiplying yourself into the lives of other people around you that God has put in your life. That's what we're going to encourage you to do through this initiative or through this, this, hopefully, this new culture that is coming. Equipping you to use your story to make other disciples. Verse 50 and 51, Mary and Joseph didn't understand any of this. They were kind of confused. And if we're really honest, the journey of, Jesus, journey of following Jesus can be very hard and very confusing. But you notice that the word I used was journey? You don't have to have all this figured out today. I don't have it all figured out today. The invitation for us today is just to take a step. And that's what they did. They, they, they started going back home, and, and, and this should ring a bell because it's the second time in the birth narrative. But Mary takes this stuff, and she's kind of wrestling with it, and she's treasuring it. She knows there's, there's something of great value in this. I don't think she's really found it yet. But she takes it, and she, she puts it in her core, and she, she chews on it, meditates on it. She treasures it, holds it tightly. So much so that she's at the foot of the cross, one of the few people who walked with Jesus all the way to the very foot of the cross while he's hanging there is Mary. So I invite you to, to take this, take God's word and wrestle with it, struggle with it, treasure it, but be willing to take a step. And that will take us all the way to learning and growing and discovering this intimate relationship with the Lord. And remember, it is necessary if we want to be bearers of Jesus' name. So at the end, I just want to leave you with some questions. Two questions. Where have you been looking for Jesus up until now? Where have you been looking for him? And then are you willing now to live for the things of God, not the things of you? Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you so much for your word and we thank you that you have sent the Spirit. And, and when Jesus prayed about the coming of the Holy Spirit or teaches about it, he says that the Spirit will lead us into all truth and your truth is found in God's word. 
this incredible love letter that we have in our hands. And it's in these pages, in these words, and through the teaching of your spirit that we find what you are about. And the more that we do that, we kind of realize that I just have been going in a different direction. I had a different concept of who Jesus was and what following him looks like. We're all in that boat. So, Father, I just pray that today through your word, you would kind of just meet us here in these questions. Help us to understand where we have been looking for you. Maybe how confused we are, how misinformed we are. Maybe how self-absorbed and distracted we are. And then, God, you just gently would, would speak to us and guide us and redirect us towards where Jesus is. And then help us discover something, the things that, that you are about and, and what you're doing in this world and how you've uniquely equipped me and each one of us here to, to be a part of that. I got to pray for us as a church as, as we seek to, to create a context, to provide tools and resources and opportunities for people to take just one step. And that that step would create momentum to take another step and another and another. And that we live this life that has got so much momentum and, and movement that it just goes on to the last breath that we have, that we are pursuing likeness of Christ. And so I just pray that you would help us to wrestle through this this week. And as we come next week and look at some other questions that Jesus asked, that God, we, we have an understanding of where I've been looking for you and, and now maybe where you are and the things that I need to address in my life to be about what you are about. I thank you for each one here, Father, and just the, the incredible stories that are represented here this morning and how these, these are people that do love you and believe in you and, and want to follow you. And I just pray that you would guide them here. And just even as we close with, with some songs that our, our worship would continue and, and Father, we would respond. And we come back next week willing to kind of wrestle through some other questions of what following you will look like. Thank you for your faithfulness and for this place and what you're doing here and that the kingdom is here. Help us to be your kingdom people. I pray this in Jesus' name.